Noise-induced hearing loss. How noise-induced hearing loss affects the diver. By Dr. Jack Mankis, performed by Dr. Franz Cronier. Learn about how the provisions of noise-induced hearing loss regulations, which are published under the Occupational Health and Safety Act in South Africa, affect the diving industry. Noise-induced hearing loss regulations apply to all workplaces where the person may be exposed to a noise level above 85 A-weighted decibels. This noise level is determined by evaluating the exposure over a period of 8 hours. Therefore, if the person is exposed to high levels for short durations, the average exposure over 8 hours may well be below the noise rating limit. The way in which such exposure is determined in practice by means of specific measurements performed by an approved inspection authority. More details are available on the DAN website. The regulations require an employer to formally assess the workplace for potential exposure above the noise rating level of 85 decibels at least once every two years. Such an assessment should consider the potential sources of noise and the extent to which people may be exposed. Other factors to include in the assessment would be the work process, where the failure of noise control measures can be expected. In terms of the diving environment, the following are common sources of loud noises. Compressor rooms are notorious for their high levels of noise and cylinder filling stations may likewise be noisy. Depending on the machinery used and the activities performed, workshops can be quite noisy. The airflow in a hyperbaric chamber, when the gas moves from high to lower pressure, may exceed 100 decibels. Peak noise levels measured inside diving helmets, especially the free flow type used in contaminated waters, also can exceed 110 decibels. Commercial divers may also be exposed to a range of noisy underwater tools where the levels exceed 170 decibels. And boat engines can cause noise exposure above the exposure limits. The assessment of exposure should be reviewed more frequently than once every two years if it is expected that the latest assessment may no longer be valid. This may be as a result of changes in the work methods or change in the environment and equipment. Whenever the assessment by the employer determines that a person may be exposed above the noise rating limit, formal measurements and monitoring of noise exposure is required. The details of the necessary noise monitoring is described in the regulations and they include references to the South African Bureau of Standards documents that prescribe certain standards. The noise monitoring may only be performed by an approved inspection authority and, as was said previously, at least every two years. The record of assessments of potential exposure of formal noise monitoring must be kept for a period of 40 years. Noise zones. All areas with noise levels above the noise rating limit must be clearly marked with signs indicating it's a noise zone. No person may be allowed to enter the area without wearing appropriate hearing protection. In addition, attempts should be made to reduce the noise levels by means of engineering or administrative control measures such as rotating workers. Medical surveillance. Persons who are exposed to noise levels above 85 decibels are required to take part in medical surveillance programs. These screen them for possible effects of the exposure to noise. These include the performance of various audiograms at baseline, regular intervals and prior to leaving the company. Not just any person may perform this. The regulations require a specifically competent person with either a qualification in occupational health or an ENT specialist or an audiologist. The records of medical surveillance must be kept for 40 years. 
training. All persons who are required to work in a noise zone are required to receive training on all aspects related to noisy work. The contents of training, as listed in the regulations, include the contents of the regulations themselves, the potential sources of noise, the health effects and safety risks associated with noise, precautions to be taken, including how to wear and maintain hearing protective devices and the limitations of their use, and the need for medical surveillance and how to report problems. Additional aspects that form part of training should be related to a number of duties and responsibilities related to working and workers. Some practicalities. Although noise exposure could be measured with relative ease above and below water, the negative effects of underwater exposures is rather difficult to predict or model. Even exposures at levels exceeding 85 decibels underwater may not always lead to hearing loss because there are many dampening factors. These include splinting of the tympanic membrane by water, increased density of gas in the middle ear space depending on the depth of the dive, the type of gas in the mixture. Certain gases like heliox or trimix have different sound transmission properties. All of these may have an effect on the auditory perception of the diver and it makes it very difficult to model a noise dose response curve to this environment. An additional complication is that blocking earplugs can't be worn with diving. So truly effective personal hearing protection is not available. This leaves engineering and administrative measures as the only practical options in many cases. Notwithstanding the difficulty in modeling noise exposure or providing personal hearing protection for divers, the typical patterns of noise-induced hearing loss are frequently identified, especially in working divers. Accordingly, as we stated here, many may qualify for compensation. In conclusion, all diving operators and employers of divers should formally conduct a noise risk assessment as prescribed in the regulations and take further action such as noise monitoring and medical surveillance whenever the noise exposure is above the legislated limit.